So for his final remarks as executive director, I want to introduce to you Thomas C. Bailey. I did make notes. <laughs> I don't know if I'll use them, but my sister, wow. <laughs> my sister, writing about my dad some years ago, wrote, he did an honest job and then some. And I thought, I hope someday that can be said of me. And that's what I've tried to do. And for all of this gratitude that's shown to me, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of it, but, but every single measure of gratitude that's sent my way reflects a blessing that's been given to me and the wonderful opportunity that I've had to, to be a part of this organization and to have the amazing privilege not just to be a part of it, but, but to, to be a leader here with these amazing and wonderful people the board, the staff, the, the volunteers, the members, the community. What an amazing community we have here. And what a wonderful privilege it's been to work in that community doing what I do. Because there's no better habitat for a land conservationist than northern Michigan. I was speaking earlier this year to the Leadership Charlevoix County group. And... Uh, Mary Fakalak on our board and Diane Listenberger for several years used to always book me for that because I was the entertainment after lunch. <laughs> and I could usually keep them from falling asleep. <clears throat> and I was giving them my typical story of land conservation talk. And as I was doing that, it flashed through my mind that I've, I've never given that talk to our members, to you. And because what we've accomplished, everything we've accomplished is about land conservation, I, before I go, before I do my final um, exit as your executive director, I wanted, to, I wanted to relate that because what an amazing legacy led up to the creation of Little Traverse Conservancy. And we are a wonderful embodiment of that legacy that began really in the early, early 19th century. There were transcendentalists, there was Ralph Waldo Emerson, there were people who, who talked about the glory of nature, there was Longfellow, there was a lot of appreciation for nature and in the early part of the 19th century President Jefferson commissioned the Lewis and Clark expedition to explore what was then this unknown, open, unexplored country as far as European settlers were concerned. And they reached the Pacific Ocean and they, they learned incredible things about this country and one of, the, one of the men on that expedition, a fellow by the name of John Coulter, took a different way home toward the end. And when he came back, he told people about what he had seen and most of them didn't believe what John Coulter said. John Coulter said, and you can just picture him around a fire somewhere talking to people, you won't believe this place I've been. <laughs> there was a place where there was hot water shooting out of the ground up in the air, boiling mud. The steam was coming out. You could catch a fish in the creek. You could throw it over your shoulder and cook it in one of them hot pots. <laughs> and the whole place smelled like burning brimstone. They called it Coulter's Hell, and they thought he was crazy. Well, we've all heard of Yellowstone. Probably John Coulter wasn't in what we know today as Yellowstone National Park. He was in the valley of the Shoshone River, and unfortunately the place that was Coulter's Hell is now flooded by a reservoir. Perhaps that's a fable for our times. 
But the sulfurous waters, the, the, to, the, to the native people, the, the Shoshone River was the stinking water river, the stink water. And after Coulter had told his stories and people didn't believe him, a few people heard from the Indians that there was such a place. And gradually, people discovered it, and, and more than the original Coulter's hell in that Shoshone Canyon, they, they discovered Yellowstone, and they realized what a marvelous, unique place this was. And of course, there were all sorts of ideas about what do we do with this? In the Northern Pacific Railroad, people said, boy, we're going to make money. We'll bring the railroad up here, and we'll put a turnstile there, and we'll charge admission for everybody who comes in, and we'll get stinking rich with this place. And some people looked at the minerals that they could mine, and they, oh, no, boy, we can make money with this, or we can do this, or we can do that. But there were a few people who said, wouldn't it be something if people could see this place just the way we saw it? If it could be left the way it is so that everybody could experience this? Kind of like a, like, a, like a national park? Those words had not been spoken before. That concept was not known in a nation of European settlement domination where the European tradition was that all land belonged to the crown. People couldn't own land, but in the United States, private property, private ownership of land was possible. A mere commoner could own land. And a lot of people predicted, you know, that, oh, that was going to result in, in terrible greed was going to rule and this, and this idea of everybody owning their own land, it was going to result in a, a greedy mess and ruination and it was going to be terrible. And yet, this nation, this experiment in private property ownership gave the world its first national park when President Grant signed that legislation in 1872. Because along with the lessons we learned from our European ancestors. We learned from the Iroquois nation, from the Lakota, from the Odawa, from the other people. We learned about the land, and we not only shaped, we were shaped by this land. And Yellowstone was a first major step in the story of land conservation. And in the 19th century, the late 19th century, land conservation grew. And it's interesting what the perspective was on land conservation by some of the native people who had been here long before. Luther Standing Bear in 1933 said, we did not think of the great open plains, the beautiful rolling hills and the winding streams with tangled growth as wild. Only to the white man was nature a wilderness, and only to him was the land infested with wild animals and savage people. To us it was tame. Earth was bountiful, and we were surrounded with the blessings of the great mystery. Not until the hairy man from the east came, and with brutal frenzy heaped injustices upon us and the families we loved, was it wild for us. When the very animals of the forest began fleeing from his approach, then it was for us that the Wild West began. But a lot of European descendants appreciated the, what to them was a wild landscape. And again, Remember, these people from Europe, what was their background? What was their experience? In Europe, the tradition, the teaching of the church, you know, was that when Satan and his cohort were thrown out of heaven, they landed in a wooded area. <laughs> and those places were downright evil. And there were evil things in those wild areas. And those wild areas needed to be tamed, and they needed to be subdued, and they needed to be made holy and proper and so on very, very much in contrast with the view of the locals here who had been here for a few millennia and had a different sense. So when those cultures were brought together to these European people, first of all, land didn't just belong to the crown, it could belong to individuals, but with individuals we learned the tragedy of the commons and so we learned that we have to protect some of these places. Yellowstone was the first national park. Later in the 19th century, Theodore Roosevelt and a man named Gifford Pinchot were instrumental in creating our national forest system. 
And that was another step forward in land conservation. It wasn't outright preservation. It wasn't just for leaving it as it was. That was for the land that was being utilized because in the late 19th century, we were using timber at a faster rate than we ever had before. The human population of this country was growing and there was this, this tremendous appetite for timber to build the cities, to build the railroads, to timber the mines and all of those sorts of things. In Michigan, timber that was thought to have been a supply good for 200 years was logged off in about 40 because of the invention of the narrow gauge railroad. If you had to just slide those logs out on ice roads in the winter time and there was only winter logging, it would have taken a long time, but the narrow gauge railroad allowed year round logging. So in the 19th, late 19th and early 20th centuries, our 200 year supply of timber was logged off in four decades. We had terrible impact of pollution as industrialization proceeded. Our streams were polluted. In the 1920s, the, the, the Stream Control Commission was created. And so out of this conservation movement that began in the 19th century, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we had the National Park System created with the Yellowstone in 1872. We had Theodore Roosevelt working on the National Forest System. and. President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, created our National Wildlife Refuge System. He did so because he was an ardent birder. Shout out to Mary Trout. <laughs> <laughs> he was an ardent birder. And he realized that whole species of birds were being eliminated because of the demand for their tail feathers as plumes for ladies' hats. And the plume hunters were killing off entire species. And President Roosevelt found that he could create, by proclamation, a national wildlife refuge. And the first one, I believe, was in Florida. And it was pr to protect the birds with these large plumes from the plume hunters. And the National Wildlife Refuge system grew. And President Roosevelt, I brought my quote bag with me, some of it, <laughs> said, conservation is a great moral issue for it involves the patriotic duty of ensuring the safety and continuance of the nation. Conservation is not only preservation of natural resources, but the prevention of the monopoly of natural resources so that they should inhere to the benefit of the people as a whole. And on that basis, President Roosevelt worked to enlarge our national forest system, our national park system, our national wildlife refuge system. And his famous comment about the Grand Canyon was leave it as it is. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. And so we learned a lot in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, what I call the first real wave of, of, of the conservation movement. And in this commentary, by the way, of things I've picked up over the years, I thank Paul Risk and Carl Hosford and Dave Dempsey for their contributions to all of this history. The next wave of the conservation movement came along with the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. In the 1930s, there was not only economic havoc in this country, there was ecological havoc. The Great Plains were literally blowing away. The practices that were used in agriculture, the kinds of plowing, the kinds of harvesting, the kinds of management of the soil that they did resulted in the literal blowing away of many feet of topsoil so that eastern cities saw darkness at at noon because of the dust that was blowing through. And the Dust Bowl was a terrible reminder of what resource mismanagement can do to our people, to our economy, to our culture, and to our land. The land was literally blowing away. And there was also a Great Depression and people needed work. So Franklin Roosevelt created the Civilian Conservation Corps. And there were other projects that were directed toward conservation during the 1930s to help relieve the economic situation, but also to help prevent the rest of the soil of our Great Plains and our agricultural heartland from blowing away. There were 
all sorts of advances made in things like contour plowing and strip cropping and the planting of shelter belts and all sorts of different ways to prevent the kinds of soil erosion that, that made the Dust Bowl so devastating. There was also a man by the name of Aldo Leopold who wrote a book called Game Management and in so doing almost single-handedly invented the modern science of wildlife management. He revolutionized conservation in this country because species were dying out. Species were being hunted to extinction. We all know what happened to the buffalo. We all know that the black-footed ferret and others were almost extinct. We all know that we did lose a number of species. The passenger pigeons that gathered by the millions here in northern Michigan were all gone. The skies, we've heard the story, the skies were darkened for days with these flocks passing by. Trees were broken down from their roosting and everything, and they were all gone. They were all gone. They were all shot, trapped in nets, salted, put in barrels, shipped to Chicago. You Probably many of you have seen the historical marker up by the Odin Fish Hatchery about some of the last big shipments of passenger pigeons from this area. We learned about conservation the hard way. And so in the 1930s, with the Civilian Conservation Corps, with the, the, the teachings of Aldo Leopold, we embarked on a new wave of conservation. And our national parks, which by then were starting to get old, saw a new infusion of infrastructure. The Going to the Sun Highway and Glacier National Park was built. You know, a lot of those national park lodges were created by the Civilian Conservation Corps and in those days. And so the second wave of the conservation movement in the 1930s was a time of major progress. It also planted the seeds for the next wave that wouldn't be known so much by the term conservation as the environmental movement. And several seeds had been planted. Certainly the work of Aldo Leopold in game management and, and the evolution of our forest systems and in Michigan, the evolution of our state forests from cut over wastelands to productive forests were all instructive and we were learning a lot from this over time. There's a woman named Rachel Carson who wrote a book called Silent Spring about the ravages of pesticides and what would happen if we used so many pesticides and killed so many birds that we, wouldn't, we would have a spring without birdsong, that we would have a silent spring. What would that be like? How horrible would that be? Aldo Leopold also wrote a book along with game management. He wrote a book called A Sand County Almanac that were just essays about the joy of loving the outdoors. He wrote, there are some people who can live without wild things and some who cannot. These essays are the joys of one who cannot. And he also wrote, I think, reflecting on the early origins of the conservation movement, man always kills the things he loves, and so we, the pioneers, have killed our wilderness. Some say we had to. Be that as it may, I'm glad I shall never be young without wild country to be young in. Of what avail are 40 freedoms without a blank spot on the map? And that book, A Sand County Almanac, had a big resurgence in popularity in the late 1960s. Something else happened in the late 1960s, and some of you will remember it. The Cuyahoga River caught fire. There was so much petroleum race, waste in the Cuyahoga River that the river caught fire. As I recall, it burned up three railroad trestles. And that was a catalyzing moment, and at that point, a lot of people said, by God, enough's enough. And they made that quantum leap to commitment. Instead of thinking somebody should do something about that, they said, we are going to do something about that. There was, a, there was an environmental movement, that, 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 a wave that crossed this country, a, a growing awareness of the fact that the environment wasn't unlimited, the land wasn't unlimited, the air wasn't boundless, and the water wasn't boundless. We had to control our use of these resources, and we had to rein in our abuse of these resources. And so the environmental movement came to be. And as the saying goes, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I was a high school kid. I was lucky enough to be born into that time. I was a high school kid in Marquette, Michigan. 
son of a wildlife biologist. I can't look at that or I'm going <laughs> to think of my dad. Um, so I grew up with conservation. When I was a kid, they said, where does your dad work? He worked for the Michigan Department of Conservation. In 1965, it was changed to the Department of Natural Resources, but before that, it was the Department of Conservation. And conservation was literally a household word. And in our house, Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac and game management sat on the bookshelves right side by side. Not only the science, but the joys of conservation. And so I grew up with it. So all of a sudden on the headlines, on the nightly news and in the newspaper, everybody's aware that there's an environment out there. <laughs> and my dad and I laughed and said, well, it looks like they're catching up with us, you know? <laughs> because as a kid, I had, I had grown up steeped in conservation. And so even though I was just a teenager, I went to a public meeting about uh, wilderness classification for Isle Royal National Park. I'd hiked Isle Royal, I loved the place, and part of it was, the Park Service was to exclude part of it from inclusion in the Federal Wilderness Protection Act of 1964. That's stupid. <laughs> All this talk about how gracious I am, I was pretty obnoxious, you know, but. Um, if ever there was a place that should be dedicated as wilderness and legally defined as wilderness, this island out in the middle of Lake Superior certainly should be classified as wilderness. And so there was a meeting right across from our house at Northern Michigan University in the Luther West Science Building where a guy from the Wilderness Society and a guy from the Michigan Student Environmental Confederation were doing a presentation about wilderness for Isle Royal. So I showed up. And I signed up. I joined the Michigan Student Environmental Confederation and I joined this group that was putting together a citizen's alternative proposal for Isle Royal National Park. And because of the good fortune and blessings of timing, that was right when the environmental movement was growing. And I was right in that wave and I had a background in it. So as a teenager, I was able to jump right in. And even though I was a high school kid, I met with the, the university students who were involved in the student environmental movement back then. And I got the Sierra Club to pay my way for a plane ticket to go to Washington to testify at the hearings on the Isle Royal Wilderness Bill, which I had helped to put together. Youper kid goes to Washington first. <laughs> First time I'd ever been on a commercial airplane. The Marquette County Airport, I got on a DC-9. Flew to Detroit Metropolitan Airport and got on to a Boeing 727. Went to Washington, flying over Lake Erie. I looked down and I saw that there was white crusty stuff over here and brown crusty stuff over there and part of it was orange and I saw firsthand what the environmental movement was all about when it came to pollution control. So, you know, being pretty brash, I went to the Senate hearing on the Isle Royal Wilderness Bill and I explained to those senators why they should do what I was telling them to do. <laughs> Met with a, an assistant secretary of the interior, all of this under the mentorship of Doug Scott from the Wilderness Society, terrific guy, and Walt Pomeroy, who at the time was the executive director of Michigan United Conservation Club. So here I was, a teenager, just in the right place at the right time to, to take part in all of this. And then I went to Michigan State University for college. Well, when you're in East Lansing, you know, in my day, for 35 cents, I could get on the bus and go down to the state capitol and lobby for environmental legislation. <laughs> so the Inland Lakes and Streams Act and the State Wilderness Act and all of these were, were things that I was involved with as part of the student environmental movement in the third wave of the conservation movement, which we know today as the environmental movement. Now, a lot of the environmental movement was focused on pollution control. But I was always interested in the land. I always liked the places where I could hike and fish and camp and, and hunt and mess around outdoors. And I suppose that's selfish, but I always liked the phrase from Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations in 1776, where he talked about enlightened self-interest. I remember the first time I heard that phrase, enlightened self-interest 
What is enlightened self-interest? Enlightened self-interest is something that helps you and helps other people too. And I think that is a phrase that sums up the land conservation movement. Because do we protect land for selfish reasons? You bet, we wanna hike, we wanna, we wanna experience that beauty, we wanna have those beautiful beaches that are open, we wanna walk along those babbling brooks and hear that sound and not see cottages, we want all that. Are we selfish? Yes, and it benefits others who want the same thing. It is an enlightened self-interest. Going right back to Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, Aldo Leopold, all of our mentors. John Muir, the poet Walt Whitman, quote that I've cited more than any others in all my years. Walt Whitman wrote that the secret of making the best persons is to grow in the open air and to eat and sleep with the earth. Shout out to Sarah Mayhew. That's what she does. That's what those pictures were about. Grow in the open air and eat and sleep with the earth. That's what we're about here in land conservation. Yeah, we might sleep in our houses and cottages, but we want those natural wild places close at hand. Because is it selfish? You bet. And we share that with others. And that's the miracle of our movement. That's the wonder of the land conservancy movement. The people who started Little Traverse Conservancy were visionaries. A couple of them are here. Boo Litzenberger was one of those. Dave Irish, Frank Pierce, John Tanton, John Fisher, Ed Koza, and Earl Larson. Dave Irish. Seven people who got together and made that quantum leap to commitment and said, not only are we going to say somebody ought to do something about this, we are going to do something about this. And they created this little, little organization, and they literally passed a hat, and they got a few stamps, and they sent a newsletter with an idea, an idea about enlightened self-interest. Let's take care of this community that's been entrusted to us. Let's make sure that we maintain a healthy balance between land development and land conservation. Let's work together to make sure that we don't screw this place up. And at the time, they probably had no idea how that snowball was going to roll downhill. It was going to gain not only momentum, but mass. It was going to gain a following. It was going to gain support from generations. It was going to become not only a community organization, but a community institution. And that's what has brought us from those origins of land conservation in the 19th century to where we are here in the 21st with enlightened self-interest, with learning the lessons that were taught by our, our mentors and forebearers, and understanding what it means not only to our world and our planet and our ecosystem, but to our community, to our kids and our grandkids. This community has the most amazing combination of natural resources, cultural resources, human resources, financial resources, as I said earlier, it's the best possible habitat for someone in the land conservation business. And we've all benefited from that. And what a ride we've had together. I, uh, when I first came here, I, I got the last couple years of newsletters. And I went through them and I said, you know, these are great, but you know what? It's all news. And there's more to this business than just news. There's, there are heart connections here. So I want to have a little space in that newsletter and just write about, about the heart connections, about that side of this business. And so the first four columns I, I wrote, I remember they were about the seasons as we went through the seasons. And then I started to four, years, four times a year pretend that I was a writer. And so many of you have, have shared in those wonderful things where we've shared the ups and downs, the joys and the sorrows, a lot about land conservation, but you indulge me in a lot, sharing a lot of personal news too. When my son was born, I wrote a column about how future generations took on a whole new meaning to me at that time. When my wife passed away, you shared that grief with me and you supported me. You supported him. And John, my son, was my inspiration because he always loved going outdoors. <laughs> Even at times when I was reluctant. Come on, Dad. 
It's a snowstorm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make snowballs. You know, and you're sort of reluctant, but then you get out here and you say, boy, I'm glad you dragged me out here. And when tragedy stuck, struck, this staff filled in. I was gone a lot to the cancer center, to hospitals. And Little Traverse Conservancy didn't miss a beat because these wonderful people kept it going. And they kept me going. And I sort of started living in black and white. I figured that's how it's going to be. And then I met Heidi, and she brought color back into my life. And you read about that, too. And it's funny how the staff and everybody, the, the board members said, boy, you seem a lot happier. <laughs> because I discovered there's life after grief. There's not only life after grief, there's, there's love and there's joy after grief. Because everything continues in a cycle. And no matter, no matter what tragedy befalls us, no matter what the setbacks are, it's all part of a cycle. And it all comes around. And it's all adding up to something. And it's all worth experiencing. And it's all worth seeing. And it's all worth embracing. Because it's life and it's wonderful. Heidi hates it when I quote Jimmy Buffett, but I love... <laughs> I love one of Jimmy Buffett's, during the, one of his songs, he talks about an old man who's been through a lot. And, um, and, and, and Jimmy says, you know, um, through all of his life and everything, you know, if you ask him, he'll smile and he'll say, Jimmy, some of it's magic and some of it's tragic, but I've had a good life all the way. And that's what life is. So when a leaf falls in the forest, it's a pretty small event, unless you're the leaf. <laughs> pretty big deal to the leaf. In the grand scheme of things, leaves are falling in the forest all the time. And that's why the forest is the forest. That's how it maintains its life. That's the way it's supposed to be. And it's a pretty big deal for the leaf. I've, I've tried to use that analogy of, of my retirement from the conservancy. You know, that's another leaf falling in the forest. In the grand scheme of things, you know, it's not that big a deal. Like, how many retirement parties, you suppose, are going on around the country today? <laughs> like leaves falling in the forest, you know? It's not that big a deal. It happens all the time. It's supposed to happen. It needs to happen. And at the same time, it's a big deal. It's a big deal because we've done so much together. And it's a big deal to me because I have been so blessed and honored to be able to do this and to be a figurehead and, and to put so much of my stamp on, on what we've done. I'm so grateful for that. Um, several of our board members have been with me the whole time. They were here before I came and they're going to be here after and that's the way it's supposed to be. That's a good thing. Tom Lagerstrom, where are you? He's back in the back there. I talked about him a couple annual meetings ago and I made him uncomfortable then. <laughs> going to do it again. Tom was here before I came, and thank God he's going to be here after I'm gone. He's down to part-time. He's slowing down a little bit. But he is the kind of continuity that is going to keep Ian Bunn from having nightmares. <laughs> Tom has been a steady partner every step of the way. And he put up with me when I was young and brash and headstrong and obnoxious. And hopefully he's enjoyed the mellowing process over the years. It's hopefully made life easy for him. But he's, he's one great example of why another leaf falling in the forest is no big deal, because there are others around. 
this organization is strong because of the many different people who make it strong. The staff, the board, the volunteers. I brag about this board. Uh, it was mentioned that I've gone around the country and taught workshops and everything. I brag about this board. I just, and, and I don't really need to brag, I just describe the board and my colleagues around the country are like, wow, <laughs> I wish I had a board like that. Because they're remarkable. They're amazing, they're selfless, and they embody that enlightened self-interest in a perfect way. Do they do it for themselves? Sure, and they should. Why would you do something that you didn't value for yourself? But they value it for others and they do it for others too. And it makes our community better, it makes our organization stronger, and as Dave Irish said one time, that's how we're going to save the world, a little bit at a time. That's how we change the world. We change our little corner of it, and we do what we can for the best reasons that we can come up with, and we work together, and it works. I literally don't know how to thank you for this opportunity that I've had for all these years. It has been so amazing, and, and, and when I hear everything that's, that's attributed to me, I, I sort of am embarrassed because I've been so lucky to be able to do it for you. But I'd like to end with some thoughts about going forward. You have a great new executive director come along. He's nowhere near as inexperienced as I was when I came here, 30 years old, a former bureaucrat from the Department of Natural Resources. I mean, <laughs> I had the best of intentions, but my experience, I had never been a boss. I had never been in charge of things. I'd never run a business. Little Traverse Conservancy is a business. It's an important business. Excuse me. I tell people. After you support land conservation, please give to the Allergy and Asthma Foundation of America. <laughs> but I had mentors. Horace Huffman, Charles Winston, Dave Irish. Is Dave, are you here? I don't know if Dave's here. Are you here? Later, he's coming later. I will never forget, he was the board chair when I was hired, and I will never forget his voice at the end of the phone when I was hoping against hope that I would get this job. The phone rang, and that gentle voice said, Tom, it's Dave Irish. I said, hi, Dave. And he said, we want you to do this job for us. And it was one of the happiest days of my life. It was a dream job. And he was a mentor not only in land conservation and running a business and running an organization, but he took me sailing too. How cool is that? <laughs> Taught me everything I know about sailing. He didn't come close to teaching me everything he knows. I can assure you of that. But that was a good example, that relationship of how we all work together. We help each other. It's a small town, and so we work together in a variety of ways. That's why a bank president runs the local land conservancy. That's why we have all of these wonderful people p pitching in, these, these Fortune 500 CEOs that donate their time to our board, local government officials, tribal leaders who take time to work with the local land conservancy because we all come together to support a cause that we believe in. What a wonderful thing that is, and what a refreshing thing in today's environment where there's so much that's divisive and contentious. And so I'll close on this note. I remember going to church when I was, um, when I was growing up. At the, at the end of the service, the, the pastor would always go to the back of the church and raise his hand, and he would say, Now go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all men and women. And I thought those were such great words to, to, to take with us going away.
And so, you know, what would be sort of a benediction for us here at, at Little Travers Conservancy? Celebrate and enjoy the diversity of ideas among us. Impose no litmus tests, insist on no orthodoxies, but welcome all who love the land. By keeping nature close at hand, keep your souls in touch with the earth, and so keep hope in your hearts for the future and love for all that is. Most of all, keep gratitude at the fore. Do that and we can never fail. Thank you and thank you and thank you. Thank you.